You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. Yeah, it's so sad. I mean, I think we all have stories of loved ones and family members or have maybe even been impacted ourselves by the overcrowded uh, healthcare system. And you know, this impacts not only the patients that are coming in, but those who are working in healthcare. Uh, right now we see a healthcare system where we have really good people who have the right education, the right skills, who want to give back, who are very skilled healthcare uh, professionals who are burning out. And it's just not right for us to see this happening because they are there for our loved ones when we need them most, when, when they need that support and that healthcare. Um, and so this is why we're... Um, Hi, I'm Althea Sindria. And I'm Frank Moore. And this is the first in a series of videos we'll be doing on the healthcare situation in the central Vancouver Island area, including on Gabriola. In this one, I speak with Lisa Marie Barron, the Member of Parliament for Nanaimo Ladysmith, about what many in BC and across Canada are calling a healthcare crisis. In future interviews, we look forward to speaking with other public representatives as well as people on the front lines. And we'll be asking you to tell us about your experiences with the healthcare system in our area. We'll tell you more about that after the interview. But for now, here's my conversation with Lisa Marie Barron. Uh, thank you for being here. You are visiting the island today uh, to, to meet with residents, and you'll also be talking uh, tonight about electoral reform. But uh, we've asked you here to uh, talk about uh, the uh, health care system, which some people regard as being in crisis uh, in Canada and in British Columbia included. Do you regard it as being in crisis? Thanks for having me here, Frank, and, and absolutely, you know, I'm hearing from so many constituents. Uh, the riding is quite big, so Nanaimo Ladysmith is the name of it, but as you know, it includes Gabriel Island, Protection Island, uh, Ladysmith, Lanceville. Uh, it's, it's quite a stretched out riding, and one theme amongst constituents all across the riding is um, people who are reaching out. Uh, because they're not gaining the access to the health care that they need. And, and you know, we're seeing all around us the impacts of that. Um, when people are not gaining access to the health care they need, then we have an overloaded uh, emergency room. We're seeing people that are, their health is getting more and more complex, which means that um, they're worse off and when we could have had uh, things uh, supported right from the onset. Um, so, you know, there's just so many who are struggling with access to health care and we're seeing the symptoms of that all around us. When you say it's becoming more complex, is that because uh, of COVID? Is it because we have an aging population? Why is that? Well, those are absolutely two big factors in it. And, um, you know, this what people need is access to the basic necessities. And unfortunately, what we have seen over the years is uh, consecutive, if I can be frank for a moment, uh, consecutive conservative and liberal governments who have not provided um, the, the federal supports required for people to be able to access um, what they need. So housing is an example, healthcare is another example. Um, a lot of people, Frank, feel um, that healthcare is solely the responsibility of the province. But I'll tell you, the problem is, is that when our Health Care Act came into place, there was uh, um, an agreement amongst the provinces and territories and the federal government that they would both be contributing to health care. So at the time, um, it was meant to be about 50-50. Now, unfortunately, when Harper was in power, he cut that significantly. So the numbers got went um, from, from much more equitable amongst the provinces and territories and the federal government to below 20%, I believe it was 18%. Now, when the Liberals ran, they promised to increase the amount of funds that were being allocated to provinces and territories, recognizing a gap in funding. And instead, we've seen that now it's at 22%. And so there is a real disconnect between the amount of funds that are going to the provinces and territories and the impacts that we're seeing are the result. We have an underfunded healthcare system. So we have a province that's doing the very best that they can with the money that they're allotted, but they need a strong um, federal leader 
to partner alongside them to uh, provide the funds required and ensure that people are gaining access to the health care that they need and deserve. Here in the uh, uh, sort of central Vancouver Island area, and I'm including Gabriola in that, we have had examples fairly recently of people going into emergency, being admitted, but then being told, well, we don't have an attending doctor for you. Mm -hmm. And in one case, there was a terminal cancer patient who had to go to emergency. He was told that and that he might have to wait in the hallway for two days before there was one. Do you hear from constituents who are concerned about this? Yeah. Yeah, it's so sad. I mean, I think we all have stories of loved ones and family members or have maybe even been impacted ourselves by the overcrowded uh, healthcare system. And you know, this impacts not only the patients that are coming in, but those who are working in healthcare. Uh, right now, we see a healthcare system where we have really good people who have the right education, the right skills, who want to give back, who are very skilled healthcare uh, professionals who are burning out and it's just not right for us to see this happening because they are there for our loved ones when we need the most when when they need that support and that health care um, and so this is why we're uh, really pushing in my position as the member of parliament pushing to make sure that we have again those federal funds being allocated appropriately but also on the federal end um, there's another piece that's really important for us to look at we have um, so many skilled people that are immigrating to Canada who are coming right here on Gabriela Island, who are moving to Nanaimo Ladysmith, and they're healthcare professionals. They have the skills, they have the education, uh, and they want to be able to contribute to our healthcare system that's currently overloaded and lacking in the people that we need to be able to keep up. And instead, they're working in fields that are important as well, but just aren't the fields that they are trained in and qualified in and want to be working in. And so another piece that really needs to be looked at is ensuring that uh, we have um, a review of the qualifications and credential requirements for people to be able to work in the profession here in town. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's just not right that these people are not working in the field. So there needs to be an overhaul of that to make sure that the people that are able to work in healthcare are working in healthcare in our communities. You mentioned that people often point to the provinces as having primary responsibility for healthcare, but what should be the federal government's role? Yeah. There's so much the federal government can be doing. You know, right now we're not seeing, as I've mentioned multiple times, that the funding being allocated, but we need that leadership. We need that um, Canada-wide strategy. Uh, you know, there's there's been many frustrations, if I can be frank. So I worked in mental health and addictions before I became member of parliament, and I saw the impacts on people in our communities when they're not getting the supports that they need. We're seeing a mental health crisis. Um, and in the last campaign that I ran in uh, and was successful in becoming member of parliament, I heard the liberals saying over and over that if elected, they would allocate uh, 4.5 billion in mental health transfers to provinces and territories. Well, this was a really great soundbite, but unfortunately we haven't seen a single dime of that being transferred to provinces. So I would like to see a government that takes the leadership required to not only make promises, but to follow through with those promises. The other piece of concern for me is that we're seeing what happens when we have a conservative government in power in the provinces across the country. We're seeing what happened historically when they were in power federally with the cutting and gutting of services. Um, we're seeing the expansion of for-profit healthcare happening in provinces across the country that have conservative leadership. Now, this is highly problematic because we need to be investing in our public health care system so that everybody can gain access to the health care that they need. It shouldn't uh, depend on how much money is in your bank account, the quality of the care or the timeliness of the care that you receive. Everybody should be accessing the health care that they need and deserve. It's something that we pride ourselves on as Canadians. Um, but instead, we're seeing these nonprofit health care um, being supported by uh, conservative governments, and it's draining our our public health care system. It's taking the good people that are working our public health care system and putting them into a for-profit um, environment, which is further exacerbating the situation that we're in without enough people in our health care system. So there's just so many ways that the federal government can take the leadership required uh, to make sure that our health care system is the um, 
the, the person-centered healthcare that we need. And, and if I could just mention one last thing, there is something though, um, there's a few things positive that are in the works. And I, and I always like to make sure that we're not just focusing on the challenges, which there are many, but there are some, um, uh, I say wins, but wins for people in the community that are happening right now. We have a dental care program that is rolling out. And I don't know about you, but it's clear that we need healthcare that's head to toe. We can't disconnect our teeth or our eyes or our mental health. All of our bodies, our mental health and our physical health is all interconnected. And we are seeing the unrolling of uh, the rolling out, I should say, of a dental care program as we speak. So right now we have seniors who are getting uh, letters to apply and to be able to start accessing health care or dental care, excuse me. Um, uh, uh, youth and children 18 and under and people living with disabilities and the next stage will be rolling out to everybody so ultimately everybody who does not have access to a dental care program who's making under 90,000 will have access to a dental care program this is huge because we know that people who aren't getting access to the dental care that they need are ending up in emergency rooms there's tons of complications that come along with the lack of access to appropriate oral health um, and then the one other piece that's coming out as well is that we're uh, looking forward to the uh, announcement that's set to come out the end of March around truly having that national public pharma care plan um, that we need in place. And so we're, we're going to keep pushing for the, the health care to be in place that Canadians need and deserve. The dental care plan is the biggest expansion of health care um, that we've seen in generations. And, and there is some good things coming and lots of work still left to be done. I know that the NDP has taken a position against further privatization uh, of the healthcare system for the reasons you describe, and yet at the same time you have an NDP provincial government here in BC that is arranging to send people down to Bellingham for cancer treatments. How, I know you don't represent the provincial NDP, but how does the NDP square those two things? Well, I can't speak about any particular examples that you mentioned there because that's not anything that's been brought to my attention, to be honest. Um, but ultimately, the province needs to have the federal supports that they need and deserve. There's, uh, as I said before, the funding that they are receiving from the federal government that they should be receiving is nowhere near where it should be. Mm -hmm. And the BC NDP um, is doing the best that they can with the funds that they have. In my position, I'm going to keep fighting for the funding to be allocated appropriately and accordingly to the BC NDP so that they can do the job of providing the health care that we need right here at home. And that needs that federal leadership. Right. Last year, the federal government struck a deal with the provinces to inject $46.2 billion into the health care system. I think every province except Quebec accepted. Is that enough? And is that money reaching the system yet? So it's not enough, clearly. Uh, the problem that we're in now is that the impacts of generations of underfunding are all coming to a head now. So you asked before about the pandemic and um, you know, there's many, the pandemic really amplified the issues that were already there, it highlighted for us the ways in which our healthcare system wasn't being funded appropriately. Look at our long-term care as, as just one example of where it really highlighted how we need to make sure that we have that public healthcare system where healthcare workers are, are um, uh, provide it with the safe working environments that they need and deserve. Um, you know, it, it, there's just so many pieces that have led to where we are today. And, you know, I always like to bring it back as well to the fact that our healthcare system and the importance of us funding our healthcare system is um, interconnected with people's um, capacity to access their basic human rights. So there's no doubt that people having access to a place to call home that's uh, safe, that's affordable, um, you know, that's appropriate for their needs is interconnected with healthcare. Um, I'm trying to think of more examples, but it's just people are, are struggling in so many ways right now because of the cost of living increasing and our healthcare system is, is so interconnected with that cost of living. And so making sure that people have what they need and deserve so that way, um, it just all interconnects together to, yeah. You mentioned that dental health care is uh, coming, yeah. and I know the NDP had a hand in causing that to happen. And in fact, you have a lot of influence with the current federal government because you basically have an agreement which helps to keep them in power. 
What else has the NDP federally been doing to um, push the Liberals to address this situation? Yeah. Well, the NDP made it happen, yeah. if I can uh, mm -hmm. turn that around a little bit. So the NDP has been pushing for dental care for for a long, long time. We did see uh, the Conservatives and the Liberals uh, working together, as they do, to vote down dental care twice. Um, and so finally now we are seeing dental care being put into place. Now what the NDP and Liberals have done is something that we need to see more of. We need to see parties working together to uh, push for solutions that are timely and are going to meet the needs of Canadians. Um, so the NDP and the Liberals uh, are together on a supply and confidence agreement that basically said here's uh, the things that we can agree on, but I can assure you uh, it's been a challenging road because we are still the opposition party. Um, there's still so much that needs to be done that's not currently being addressed by the Supply and Confidence Agreement, and we keep pushing for those. Um, however, we have seen successes as a result of this work through the dental care program, through pharmacare that's coming. Um, Anti-scab legislation is another uh, piece of work that is in uh, the works to ensure that uh, uh, federally uh, unionized workers are not having um, people coming in and replacing them. That's taking away their bargaining power to ensure um, uh, a fair working environment. Um, affordable housing, we've seen increased uh, uh, funding into affordable housing. However, it's nowhere near enough, but a move in the right direction. And specifically funding uh, for Indigenous, by Indigenous people um, is, is some, an area that I'm particularly proud of because we do, we know that Indigenous people are particularly impacted um, by um, a lack of affordable housing. So to see this funding being allocated and to see Indigenous people taking the lead on this work is, is wonderful, but there's still so, so much to do. Um, I could speak from, from my own work that I've been doing. Um, you know, I've been pushing really hard um, for the derelict vessels that we are seeing increasingly along the shorelines that are being abandoned, polluting our oceans, they're impacting the marine ecosystems in, in so many ways. So I've been pushing really hard to have a bill on uh, removing those vessels, but also ensuring that we have a plan in place so that it's not easier for uh, vessel owners to abandon, to abandon their vessels than it is to dispose of it properly. So there's uh, a lot of work and movement happening on that. The Anchorage is along side Gabriola as well. Um, there's, uh, I'm hoping that there's going to be some good work uh, moving forward because uh, long story short, there is some moving pieces happening in the Transport Committee right now as a result of um, the work of my colleague Alistair McGregor's bill around the anchorages, recognizing the mar marine protected areas surrounding um, Gabriola and the ecologically sensitive areas that they are that are being used as a overflow parking lot for the Vancouver port. Um, so looking at having those anchorages removed to protect our, our beautiful um, oceans that surround Gabriela Island. Um, the disability, um, disability benefit is another area that's been huge. There's so much work uh, that needs to be done and so much uh, that I'm seeing moving in the right direction. But um, I'm, I'm not going to lie, it's, it's challenging and my... Um, I take it very seriously to ensure that I'm there in Ottawa representing our community, the challenges that uh, we are experiencing, and also spending some time to brag about the incredible strengths and, and benefits of why so many people live here in this riding and on Gabriel Island. Right. Finally, I want to ask you a question in your role as Deputy Critic for Mental Health and Addiction yeah. for the NDP. Um, those play a, a large role uh, for many citizens in our community and a large role for many unhoused people in our community. Do we have enough recovery beds in BC to address that problem? No. No, we do not. We absolutely do not. And, you know, um, people need to have the wraparound supports required um, when people are struggling with mental illness, they're struggling with substance use disorder, um, the needs of 
people can vary. Um, you know, when I worked in mental health and addictions, I was frontline and also uh, provided education and so on. But one of my parts of my role was to be the person who spoke to youth, who spoke to families, who spoke to service providers to identify what exactly it was that would be able to support them. For some, it meant um, connecting them with peers who've gone through a recovery process. For others, it was counseling. For others, it was treatment, both uh, detox and long-term um, supports. But what people need is, is, it defers for each person. But one theme of what people are asking for is the amount of on-demand treatment options required to meet the needs that are currently out there. And right now we have people who wanna access treatment, uh, who are on a wait list for a long time. And quite frankly, it's a two-tiered system as well, where people who have a lot of money are able to access the treatment that they need in a much quicker um, amount of time than those who don't have the money. We need to have the public, um, publicly available options for everybody, regardless of income, to be able to access the treatment that they need that's gonna help them uh, to work through what it is uh, that they need um, and just having a one-size-fits-all approach is, is not going to help. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the treatment options in place for people right now at a time when they're struggling. Lisa Marie Barron, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us. Yes, thank you so much, Frank. I appreciate being here. Okay. Thanks for watching the interview. And now we'd like to hear about your experiences, good or bad, with the healthcare system in the central Vancouver Island area. Can you access a doctor when you need to? Can your loved ones get the medical care they need? What have been your experiences with our clinics and hospitals? And what questions would you like us to ask our public officials? Send your stories and questions to health at lifeongabriola.tv or message us via our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Gabriola Media Society. We look forward to hearing from you.